Thank you, Deborah. And since we're um, fairly uh, select a group, uh, would it be possible to do a quick round of intros so I know who's on the call? Maybe I can. We, this will give us more uh, ability to dive into specific things and questions that people have. Yes, 100. You know me already, so I'll be quiet. <laughs> Go. Hi, hi, Tim. Uh, I'm Jane. I work at Two Games, and uh, I think there's a couple of us in this in this group uh, from us two games um but yeah we're taking part in the green game jam um yeah super interested to hear what you're going to talk about today um and i work um on the operational side um so not a game developer but um, i'm also kind of building some of our sustainability stuff at the studio so this is all super helpful for me nice to meet you Nice to meet you. I must be sure I write down all the company names because I'm sure they will mean something to my teenage son, who I, who's very keen that I tell him about this uh, session. Who wants to go next? Don't be I, shy. Yes, I, I will go. Hi, I'm Boris Manura. I'm working at Ubisoft and I'm working on project uh, Steam Not Ship that is, that is Riders uh, Republic. And uh, personally, I'm, uh, I've started my uh, ecology journey uh, some uh, years ago and uh, really uh, looking forward to everything you will say uh, today. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I can go next. Um, I'm Gianluca uh, from Mass2 Games as well. I'm a programmer and, and we just finished working last year on a game called uh, Alba Wildlife Adventure, which is about nature and preserving it, which is really nice. And um, I'm really excited to, to hear what you have to say today and excited to be part of the game, game Green Game Jam. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Starris. I'm mid child care right now. It's my daughter. I'm a game director at Us Two Games, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys start talking about. And I, <laughs> yes, I am Maria. Uh, I'm a writer at Vuga. And uh, yeah, like everyone else, very excited to hear what uh, is going to be said. And actually our first uh, jam day is tomorrow. So it's very timely for me as well. I think I'm last. Um, so Tim, I'm on Sam Barrett's team um, in ecosystem. So yeah, great to meet you. Great. So uh, let's let's kick it off um, today. The, the topic is um, this is the logo of the UN decade on ecosystems restoration. As you can see, uh, we've aligned with the color code of the sustainable development goals. But this is mostly about saving forests, oceans, uh, wetlands, mountains, coral reefs. So basically all the ecosystems on the planet because the United Nations has decided to call the next 10 years the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, where the main goal is to prevent, halt, and reverse some of the damage we've done to the natural world. We will kick off on the 5th of June. So that's just over two months from now. So we're quite busy preparing that. There'll be a um, global uh, launch event involving many organizations working in the space from the World Bank to WWF to um, documentaries by Netflix and, and many other things. So the, the, the aim is really to build a global restoration movement. And since um, the gaming Gaming offers an entry point for an audience that we otherwise have difficulties in reaching, and it can also take audiences deeper into a topic. We're quite keen to work with you and also with others on this. So thanks to the Playing for the Planet Alliance for pulling this together. Um, my name is Tim Christophers, and as Deborah said, I um, my day job is called heading the Nature for Climate branch, but uh, most of my time at the moment is spent preparing the UN Decade on ecosystem restoration and this global movement. Um, 
if I had, um, if I would summarize what we need now in one sentence, maybe that would come as a surprise to you, but what we need now is more human imagination at the moment, because we are we're staring down this dystopian abyss of climate change and biodiversity loss and zoonotic pandemics. Um, and it's difficult for people to imagine that a different future is not only possible, but very achievable if we are locked into the gloom and doom scenario. So how do we get out of that? How do we get out of that? Um, gloom and doom scenario and into something that is more inspiring and more imaginative. This is, of course, where I hope you will come in um, as one of the challenges that uh, we face. I post an article that you can read maybe later at your leisure in The Guardian that came out uh, a few days ago that describes what it would look like to regreen the entire peninsula of Sinai, which is a part of Egypt and was in the news recently because where it was where close to where this big container ship in the Suez Canal got stranded. What would it look like to turn that desert back into the green area it once was? And what do we need for that? So to go into that, I've um, <clears throat> prepared a few slides that I'll just um, pull up now and I'm not really a very frequent Zoom user. We Teams seems to be our platform of choice in the UN, but I hope this works. Yep, we see it. Okay, great. So um, let me then dive into um, what we need. So as I said, we need imagination. And what do we need imagination for? The the task ahead of us, if you if you look at the UN decade and what we want to do is um, restoring 1 billion hectares of degraded ecosystems at minimum. So that needs quite a few superheroes at every level, but I would say mostly at um, the local level and the level of ecopreneurs. How do we generate a new generation of ecopreneurs and the generation restoration that will bring this about. So for that, just a few um, figures. If you think about a restored area of 1 million hectares, if you get into your car after this call and you drive for one hour in a straight line at 65 miles per hour, which is about 100 kilometers, then you make a right turn, you drive for another hour in a straight line. And you do that twice more until you've driven around a square. That is an area of 100 by 100 kilometers or 1 million hectares. So it's quite a big area. And we need about 1000 of those to be restored, replanted, regrown, regreened, uh, the fisheries restocked. That is the challenge ahead of us. And the people in general have difficulties imagining the size of change like that and how, how it could happen. But we bring about change like that all the time as humans on the planet. If you think about all the data centers that now exist in the world to power the internet, that is the biggest architectural and infrastructure achievement that humanity has ever built. And it is much more complicated um, and probably costs also somewhat more than, than what we need here. What we need here, though, is different because it involves a lot more people to make that change. A lot more people need to take action, need to push their politicians, need to pick up a shovel, need to join a local restoration organization and bring this about. Tree planting has been a lot in the news recently as sort of the rock star of the restoration movement. Everybody knows about trees. Everybody likes trees. Planting trees is actually a lot of fun. If you do it right, they might even grow and survive. And so again, just to, just to bring the scale of the challenge into perspective, if you 
after this jam, go out and plant one tree. And you do that for you do that every second for 11 days without stopping. You would have planted a million trees. To plant a billion trees, you would have to plant one tree per second for 31 years. And to plant a trillion trees, which is the aim of a World Economic Forum led initiative that Salesforce has spearheaded and where they've now gotten Google involved and also Microsoft and, and others called the Trillion Tree Initiative or 1T.org, you would have to uh, leave after this webinar, go out there and plant one tree every second without a break for 31,000 years. So it's not something that any, anybody can do alone. So we don't need the sole superhero. We need some kind of collaborative superhero that uh, works with as many other people as possible. And we also need a kind of simulation of the future that shows how a big change like that is achievable. If we do this, we could sequester enough carbon from the atmosphere to give us the significant time that we need to decarbonize our economies and avoid catastrophic climate change. It would probably do um, about 50% of the job to halt the rampant biodiversity loss that we see. So restoration would help with a lot of things. What we have in the world are many of these 1 million or larger areas that are ready for restoration. And one area that I know quite well is here in South Africa at the Eastern Cape, very poor rural region where restoration would also create a lot of jobs. And if you drive through that region, it's it used to be prime big five habitats. So probably one of the best black rhino habitats in the world. Elephants, uh, uh, leopards, lions, buffalo, all the other wildlife that Africa is so famous for and that people pay lots of money to see. All of that used to live here until about 200 years ago when massive overgrazing in this region started, mostly with goats. And the, the landscape was transformed. And because it was transformed before um, anybody who's alive today was born, people just think this is normal. But it is not what this, it is not what the power of this landscape really is and what the full potential of the landscape really is. It's a, it's a, it's a shadow of what it could be. So the imagination you need to see what it could look like looks like something on these pictures. On the right, you have areas that are being restored and regrowing. Um, and on the other side, you have areas as they look now. Uh, so in um, some of the pilot plots we're working on, we are doing the restoration and researching all the carbon and biodiversity benefits that this could have. But this needs to be scaled up massively. It needs to be become a new economic priority for the region. Governments need to rechannel fiscal incentives, taxpayer money into changing that entire landscape. How do we get people to see that opportunity, to want to be part of it, to either start a company that uh, makes a profit doing this restoration, starts a lobbying organization that makes sure the government prioritizes this, um, starts uh, perhaps a uh, restoration economy that builds on the increased productivity on this land. How do we get people involved in this huge uh, challenge that is getting more urgent by the day? So I'll stop here for a moment after the slide for maybe a bit of discussion or questions if you have. What are the key bottlenecks for this global coordinated challenge and this response to the climate and the biodiversity crisis? Massive restoration is possible, but we have a lack of imagination. If you can somehow help to remove that, that would be a huge contribution. We have a lack of political will. Depending on where you live, your government probably spends anywhere between 10 and 100 times more of your taxpayer money 
on making oil, coal, and gas cheaper than on investing into nature. How do we change that? How do we make people aware? Then what is the business case? This is maybe not so much a challenge for you, but more one for us. Uh, how to make sure that the returns on investments in restoration can be so significant that this becomes a multi-billion dollar global market. We need early movers, angel investors, some of them from Silicon Valley and, and elsewhere to make sure we build the right marketplace for this emerging restoration movement. Obviously, there's a big technology challenge. This is, again, something that could be gamified. How do you actually monitor that all these trees that are restored and the grasslands that are regreened, the coral reefs that are restored? How do we monitor that that actually happens? And while there's a lot of uh, advances in remote sensing, it's still a field with a lot of tech challenges. New generation of ecopreneurs, maybe the biggest ask I would have for you, how do we get a lot of new young people into this challenge? And um, I mentioned my son in the beginning, I, I think he, he, uh, he would love to become a game developer because that's, you know, that's the, the thing right now. He's also sort of interested in nature, but I mean, a lot of the our a lot of the next generation's eyes are on social um, media, on online gaming, on programming, and that's fine. But how do we combine that enthusiasm with something that has a real impact in helping us survive the next uh, centuries as a human civilization? And if we don't avert runaway climate change, the future doesn't look good. So we have to get this right. Finally, inspiration. If there's anything you can do to help us get the word out that this is not only possible, but it is feasible to regreen the entire planet, that would also be a great help. Let me stop here and um, pause for questions and, and anything you might want to ask, comment, or discuss. Thank you, Tim. Katie has also joined, by the way. Oh, you're Hello. muted. Hi, sorry. Hi, sorry. Yeah. I'm a little bit late. I was, I just, it was so interesting when I jumped on. I was like, oh, why did I get up 15 minutes late? But hello. Um, thanks for mentioning me. <laughs> Welcome. Oh, I meant Tim was muted because he was saying something, but he's muted. <laughs> ah, sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah, you're, it's great that you could join. It's great that everybody else could join. So um, this is the, the nucleus of our green jam game developers from various companies that are looking to help us with specific challenges. In this case, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration and how that can really become the global movement that the world needs now to repair uh, some of the damage we've done to the planet. And um, I was just pausing for any questions, comments, anything that was unclear. Like, quick, uh, quick question on the side, like it's, how big do you think the, the objective of restoring is compared to conserving what we have currently? Because if we keep going with the current trend, it will be way worse pretty soon. And then the restoration uh, challenge will be even, even bigger. Uh, how, how do you deal with these two fights that we need to, to lead? So the, thanks, Boris. The ratio is about, out of 100, it's about 17 to 83. And why is that? So 17% is, is uh, the coverage of protected areas globally. That's gone up quite a bit in the last decade. It's one of the few good news on biodiversity, and there's some that now advocate for extending that to 30% which is probably unlikely. Um, but even within the 17% of all land that is currently protected, there's a lot of um, protected areas that are not well managed. So even there, we have degradation. And even protected areas can be in need of restoration. 
But the bigger question is, what do we do on the other 80%, 83% of the land? And there's significantly fewer protected areas in coastal and marine areas than on land. So this is more a question of our relation as humans to nature, which and nature should not be understood as only existing in protected areas. This is something that is, I think, part of the problem that we see, you know, us here, and then there's maybe some protected nature somewhere that uh, is very far away from us. This is about restoring the productive landscapes as well that provide our food. The world loses fertile soil at, an, at a very alarming rate. But nobody talks about that because we take it for granted that there's always going to be food on our table and there's always going to be fish that we can buy cheaply. Fish stocks, um, there's an estimate that over 60% of all global fish stocks are now overfished um, beyond sustainable limits and some of them might collapse. You could still say that leaves us other 40% to also overfish. But at some point, that is going to become a, a massive problem. How do we anticipate that problem and restore without taking all of the fisheries out of production? So this is, this is not a challenge that can be solved by conservation alone. Conservation is important and needs to be increased. But this is about how, how do we relate to all of the nature on this planet that we are a part of? So it's it's a challenge that goes well beyond conservation, in my view. I have a maybe a couple of questions. Um, I was curious around this idea of this lack of imagination that exists and this kind of call for superheroes to, to come in with, with bright ideas and, and you know new, new new ways to approach things. But what, what does that look like? Um, you know, what, what I'm trying to picture, like what imagination is missing, like, or what are what are the limits that you're currently facing in terms of imagination? If if somebody, I don't know where, where you live, Jane. Are you in the UK? Uh, yeah, in London. In London. Yeah. So if uh, Boris Johnson said tomorrow. Uh, we need a new airport that's got to be bigger than Heathrow and it has to be built in Northern Scotland. You know, people would probably say, you know, that's perhaps not a good idea, but they would know what an airport looks like. They would know how much it costs. They would know, you know, that it, it's a massive infrastructure undertaking. And people would sort of have an idea that, you know, it will have two or three runways and, you know, it, it, it'll take 10 years to complete. Same with a four lane highway, with a deep sea port, with a big bridge, people would say, oh yeah, well, that's another one of those. And it you know, just costs about a billion dollars uh, or in the case of an airport, significantly more. But if he told you tomorrow, we need to restore all the peatlands in Northern Scotland, you would be like, well, I don't really even know what peatlands are. And uh, I don't know how many there are in Scotland, don't know where they are, don't know what it takes to restore them. Uh, and what that would cost, who knows? So that is what I mean with lack of imagination. Mm. It's very clear when we speak about things that we take for granted as the infrastructure that we know, but if we look at nature as being absolutely essential to our survival and becoming the green infrastructure that we need, we don't know what this looks like. Well, some people know more about this than others, but the point is that we need to make that better known and we need to make it clear that this is not only possible, but it's very necessary to do these kinds of infrastructure investments. Now, instead of building a new uh, Heathrow runway or a new airport in Northern Scotland. Thank you. I, I kind of had another question, which I guess is sort of related to that, but I was trying to, I was trying to sort of think huh, how how might i bring this into a game or what what is a good example i was wondering if if that had crossed your mind you know when you're thinking about the future generation your your child maybe becoming a game developer one day like what would be what would be an ideal situation in your mind it it makes me think of one of my favorite cartoons i don't know if you know kelvin and hobbs it's maybe a, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm a sort of other so there's one cartoon where 
Kelvin's dad, who, as you know, works in a patent office. So he has probably one of the more boring jobs. And Kelvin talks about this superhero, you know, when, and, and his dad uh, jokes that he, he is the, the office superhero, you know, he goes to the bat fax and he goes to uh, write a bat letter to somebody. So it's, 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 a, it's a kind of superhero that I think would, would be, it, it would be more about collaboration to do um, a sim, a sim city kind of game, like a, a Klim city, you know, what is the climate simulation that would lead us towards understanding the importance of nature and of restoring ecosystems at that scale? And what are, what are, what is needed to do it? Because if you pick up a shovel today and you run outside, you quit your job, you start planting trees, as I said at the beginning, it would take you 31,000 years planting one tree every second to do this alone, superhero style. What we instead need is changing the UK's fiscal policy on agriculture. We need to change uh, that the government pumps money into building a new coal mine and instead pumps money into saving and restoring the peatlands. And for that, you need an understanding of the decisions that are needed. So I don't know, Cl Klim City or whatever uh, uh, game is, uh, maybe that already exists. I don't know. I don't think so. It's a good idea, though. You should make it. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. That's that's really helpful. Um, I see there's a couple of points on the chat from from Katie and I'm keen to give her a few minutes also to share with uh, her um, what she does and that she's advising us a little bit at the UN um, even though Katie we have not yet met and I've only seen your name in email so good to uh, meet you even if it's on a webinar where we both uh, happen to be but Katie, if you have a few minutes, it would be great to hear from you and about your book and um, <clears throat> what your approach is. Oh, hi. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sorry, I didn't really understand what this event was today. I just got the email saying, join this thing. And I didn't know if it was connected to the UN. And I was just like, okay, oh, sorry, so I was a bit late. I, didn't, I don't even understand the context of what the group is here. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I've just got a small child um, pulling my, what is it, sweetie? Yeah, you can do makeup, sweetie. It's just here. I'm um, sorry. Sorry. No, um, no, no worries. And we can <laughs> we can also come back to this later. And I, okay, it was no, my fault that I pulled you into this last minute. So we are amongst the group of game developers from various software companies that are uh, developing games, and they are many of them are familiar already with the concept of building green nudges into games or even making games that are about uh, improving the environment. So this is. This is the Green Jam crew. And um, I just thought this was very close to what you are doing and what you've been starting to advise us on. And uh, sorry to pull you into this um, last minute, but maybe now you understand the context a little bit more and uh, <laughs> would be great okay, to well, just hear so, a little um, bit from you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I'm sorry, I was, I'm, so I'm totally unprepared and just woke up and didn't really realize what the, was but it sounds like perfectly I'm really happy to be here and thank you for inviting me on um so a quick snapshot so I'm really glad that there's a whole bunch of like game designers who are interested in working on sustainability I'm an environmental engineer I found environmental engineering um way too boring for me because I wanted to do more creative things that had a bigger impact and so I started studying software design and creative design and then that sort of taking me into game design and I started to read behavioral psychology and game design and I thought this is phenomenal all the sustainability folks really need to um I'm just going to go away from my daughter's computer really need to know about this and so I did a deep dive into the academic research and then wrote this book called how to save the world which is really um a design thinking a sort of design framework for bringing in behavioral nudges and game of game design to sustainability um thinking but with a core focus all around the feedback loop like how do we get better satellite data um, you know kilowatt hours from building sensing water this idea that we need it to be like a fitbit so I call it like fit fit for the planet design um, rather than like game design I really try and center everything around like the core measurability 
and do that kind of design. And so um, UNEP um, discovered this. And so now I'm going to be working, I haven't started yet, working on this um, decade of restoration project, trying to do some um, gamification design uh, around that. Um, anyway, so snapshot. I wish I had a copy of my book. I have a copy of my book somewhere. Um, I think I shared. I, uh, I, th I, I think I shared a link to it, uh, <laughs> if I'm if I'm not mistaken. But um, anyway, I shared a link to your website so people can oh. can find it there. Um, um, yeah, thanks, Katie. And um, again, great to have you come on board. This is not going to be the last conversation we are having, but I was quite keen to also introduce you to this group and through Deborah, uh, who, and I, I'm uh, so glad there this, is this, this, oh this green jam enthusiasts. But um, Deborah, maybe back over to you and to hear if there's any questions from anybody um, specifically on these ideas uh, of what kinds of games might be needed, what other questions um, you have, and if you have more questions for me, because uh, I, you know, I could talk about this subject for quite some time. Um, but I'm also <laughs> aware that no, it's that I think. Many people have probably gotten a memo by now that there's something wrong with the climate and there's something wrong with biodiversity and uh, some other issues as well. So I think it's more about what we can do about it now. And I think the online gaming is is, is part of the, the answer. So back over to you. Uh, yeah, no, th thanks so much. And really nice to meet you, Katie. I'm going to read through all your stuff. It sounds like it's super relevant. So I would, I would also like to follow up with you separately, if that's cool, because uh, oh. you can probably help us out. Um, can I just jump in with one um, yes. final little thing that I just thought was super exciting about this? Um, so when I just jumped onto the call, it was talking about imagination. And I just discovered and made contact with an academic researcher who's doing the first academic research, sorry about my crying child, into the, the power of environmental ad imagination. And I've never seen it done anywhere. So I posted his two studies. I think his name's Joshua Fisher. Um, anyway, so I've emailed him and I think that's a super exciting space. To, um, anyway, I'm going to turn my audio off now. But anyway, just read the, read the Sound, Sounds like you have more pressing <laughs> issues to attend to, but thanks, Katie. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. I guess, um, thank you, Katie. And yes, we'll definitely look, look at the links that you shared. Um, I guess one question I had, and you know, definitely want you to go back through the rest of your talk as well, because <laughs> I know there's more. Um, but I guess with like, for example, this trillion tree campaign, right? Like if we got everybody towards tree planting, I guess is the, are the projects and is the infrastructure there to plant the trees in the right way, like you were saying, or is that also part of the problem? It is um, also part of the problem. And it's, um, I, I think it's a problem that can be overcome, but at the moment we, lack all the basic infrastructure to scale up um, tree planting to the level where people and companies and countries have committed, including that there's a lack of, um, there's a lack of available tree seedlings at the right diversity and from the right uh, origin. So there's not an exotic species you plant um, in a place where it doesn't belong but you build on local biodiversity. So there's a there's an entrepreneurial challenge there. There's a challenge that people don't really um, know um, how to go about it, even if they want to plant a tree themselves, or even if they want to donate some money or go to a trusted partner, even that is not at the moment very clear because this marketplace is just developing. So there's no such thing as a sort of Yelp for restoration, where you can go and see what is a trusted company in this field? What is a trusted NGO in this field? What do they do? Are their projects for real? Are they taking me for a ride? The, the kind of trip advisor for this ecosystem restoration um, is, is not there. I mean, we're working on it with, a, we're building a digital hub for the UN decade that will have, that will hopefully provide that marketplace and the Yelp function and the um, the connector function. Um, but the uh, the challenges are 
are immense and they they are at every level what is what is on the positive side is that there's a lot of interest in this from the private sector from governments from uh, individuals we have surveyed about 3000 respondents now in terms of what they expect from the UN decade and, and also from our website um, and the um, there's a lot of personal interest in this topic is uh, and and the the respondents are quite young over 50% are under 34 of these 3000 people who filled out our, our survey maybe biased towards you know people who are more savvy at finding information on the web but um no to answer your question that is not an issue that is solved yet gotcha because i think like and i don't want to speak for everybody but what i have noticed like in this jam and last year's jam is that everybody is really willing to um to help to make a difference to try to rally you know their influence and their player base towards a certain cause or et cetera. But it's really hard to find a clear direction of, of where to guide those people. But it sounds like that that direction just doesn't exist yet. And maybe that's actually what everyone needs help with is just setting that direction in the first place, because it sounds like there is no place to direct somebody necessarily and say, if you go do this, this will make a difference. Um, I think that's been like the tension with the, with the jam as well is where we're like, oh, where can we send people to go do the thing and take the action? But really, that end goal doesn't exist yet, I suppose. Is that true? Um, yes, that is true. And we hope to um, solve part of that with the digital hub for the decade. When we launch the decade on World Environment Day, which is uh, the 5th of June, usually we get a lot of spike. Uh, we get a, quite a high spike in, in interest in Google searches on that topic. Uh, in 2018, for example, the theme of World Environment Day was plastic pollution. So plastic in the oceans, uh, people really researched how does plastic get into the oceans? What's the issue? How, what, can, what can we do about it? So we want to use that spike that we expect um, around the 5th of June to channel people towards that digital hub. So one task for this little group could maybe also to help us with the user experience of the digital hub. I mean, we have a digital design firm that, that builds this for us, but um, maybe a little testing of what the um, UN decades digital hub looks like um, would be would be very useful. I see there's two questions in the chat now from Chris. So in most places in the world, they are required to plant and replant. But this is not what we mean with restoration, because that's um, that is basically just called sustainable forest management and is a requirement by law. Um, what we mean with restoration is that you take areas that are degraded or you take forests that are degraded and you uh, increase the biodiversity, you increase the forest stock. Um, or if you take another ecosystem for a coral reef where there's massive die off at the moment, even in Australia with the Great Barrier Reef, um, there are many factors that need to be in place for restoration, but there is an option to reseed um, coral reefs. Um, so this, these kinds of approaches and techniques are in some cases well known, like forests and, and other and ecosystems on land, but for the oceans, there's also still a lot of research that needs to happen. And I saw Katie's comment that open forest does this kind of matchmaking. There are about 20 companies that do the same thing as Open Forest, and there's a new one popping up about every week or month. And that's part of the problem, that there's so many offers, which is normal for an emerging market. But it's a very confusing picture, even for somebody like Microsoft, who just invested their first $15 million into uh, nature-based solutions as part of their climate change strategy. And they were utterly confused at the beginning in terms of where to go, who to work with, 
how to find the right projects. Um, <clears throat> there's many of these kinds of um, platforms, um, but some of them are better than others. Does anyone else have? Oh, there's more to your deck, isn't there? <laughs> I was like, uh, uh, there... Not necessarily. We just keep on chatting, um, okay. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I do have more slides, but we don't have to go through them. I think uh, it's probably more interesting to see if people have further questions. And if not, I'm, of course, also happy to share the um, the slides with you. Cool. You can email Does anyone them to else everybody. have more questions? I've got a few more, but I've been talking a lot. So I'll let other people. No. <laughs> Um, ah, Boris says, sorry, I have to leave curfew in France. <laughs> Bye, Boris. <laughs> um, I guess, and maybe this is too hard of a question, but what, what would be most helpful for this group to do? Like, is it, for example, like you said, driving people towards the platform that you're building on June 5th? Is it just trying to inspire you know our players about um nature in general so that they have more of like a like a heart connection with things is it driving people towards tree planting because we do need a trillion trees and even if it's not perfect like let's start somewhere is it you know getting petitions signed because we need more political um movement and you know, we have two pledges, for example, that we're working on for oceans and forests, and we're looking to get 10 million signatures. Is that helpful? In a workshop we had yesterday, somebody said like, no, it's not useful unless it's really specific and tied to a specific like locale within the world where the government maybe isn't already doing something. Like, is that true? I think there's a lot of, yeah, it, do you see anything as being more valuable than the other, or is it just all of the above? Or I think it's um, spreading the word about the importance of this and the uh, opportunity in this would probably be the most useful thing. So, um, what what is the opportunity in terms of jobs, livelihoods, um, enjoyment, fulfillment. I mean, this is a, is a great uh, area to work in, linking um, nature and people and linking nature with the fight against climate change, which is the defining issue of our time. So getting more people to be enthusiastic about working for this or towards this, whether it's in their private time outside of work or shifting part of their work towards this that would be would be great um, there are many other things that can be done including uh you know i don't know if, if there's somebody from twitch in the playing for the planet alliance but using um using platforms to help people find each other and take collective action is also something that where we could use uh help and the digital hub will have some basic functions around that. But if you want to do a beach cleanup in Sydney or wherever, um, and you want to organize a local um, community of people around something that is actually active ecosystem restoration, those kinds of platforms also are um, are very useful. There's of course many ways to do to do that, but uh, the, the link between connecting online and then connecting in the real world would, would be useful if we could find a way to transfer some of the cohesion and connectivity that exists between online players into action in the real world, that, that could be useful. I think, um, and like Katie's put it in the chat as well, how do we narrow it down into action? I guess that's maybe my question too. If if we have those people and it's a collective of people who want who are ready to take an action, 
like is doing a beach cleanup is that is that like yes that's what people should be um sort of rallying around or focusing their energy towards are there other things that are more valuable when it comes to climate change that people should be rallying towards like should we get everybody just to stop eating meat because you know, that's a that's a huge uh, like polluter and takes up land mass and all these things. So I'm wondering if there's like a, yeah, like a, a best practice for actions for people, I guess. Yeah, I'm actually just trying to find it, but I can't find it right now. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll send it to you. Um, we are writing what is called the practical guide for World Environment Day, which we do every year on depending what the theme is. Um, uh, and this year for restoration, it will have the hands-on activities that people can can do from what you eat and where you buy it and where it's sourced from to taking local action to taking um, to being politically active on this topic. So it will have a lot of hands-on suggestions, but it's still being drafted. And this is, I think, also something where my colleagues have. Uh, are going to ask Katie for their for her help uh, in terms of framing that in a way that is um, appealing, not the gloom and doom, um, but the can do kind of practical guide. But I can share that with you, Deborah. If you can send that to the group, that would be uh, would be useful. It will also be online in about a month from now. But I'll send you the draft that we have now um, that you can take yes, a look we'll at. Yes, we'll take it early. That sounds good. <laughs> I got to say, I'm um, I'm terrified by the prospect of having to uh, pare down this enormously broad scope of all of the things to do to restore the earth and try to <laughs> pare them down into discrete actions and design them in a way that's like user friendly because there's just so many and so, there's like there's like thousands of them, right? You got to and you have to be so specific. Um, so it's a very it's a very big um, challenge. Yeah, there's luckily uh, quite a few people working on it, including about 50 partners. We have UNESCO, the World Economic Forum, um, IUCN, uh, the World Bank, uh, but also many local partners, organizations, NGOs. So we're a lot of a lot of people working towards this, and that movement will also become more visible on the 5th of June, when when everybody from WWF to the Rio conventions and and Lots of governments um, talk about the UN decade, so it's luckily not something that we have to sort out um, with a small group um, in in UNEP. But uh, it it would be useful to have a look at this from a perspective of how is this appealing, in particular to people who usually are more drawn towards playing um, online games than than you know planting trees but um yeah it's i i think the of of what you asked deborah all of the above is probably the the, the correct answer but the these two challenges then i think would be the most important one ones creating a game or games that can can speak to the imagination that is required to see how a different world can be created, like a simulation game or whatever um, is possible. And the other one is um, help to, to bring the constituency you have more towards the army of ecopreneurs that the world needs in the coming decade and really the century if you look at the 20th century, it was a century of chemistry and physics and has gotten us enormous, enormous uh, progress and advantages, also nearly killed us. But um, the 21st century needs to be the century of, of ecology. It needs to be the century where we become ecologically literate. And this is not done in a decade. It's not done in 10 years. This is like what human rights were in 1920, where you talk to people about basic human rights in 1920, they would not have heard about the concept that didn't exist. It wasn't an international thing. Uh, women were not allowed to vote in most countries. Um, so we are at a similar stage as we were at that time now with ecological literacy. 
and sorry to be ending uh, something by saying something in ancient Greek, but if you look up the word oikos, it means the household. So the economy is the knowledge um, of how to manage your household. It's the management of the household. Ecology is the knowledge of how you should manage your household. So somewhere along the way, those two concepts got totally separated and most people think they have nothing to do with each other, but they have the same root. So we have to go back to that understanding and that level of ecological literacy. But now I'm done lecturing you and I have to sign off. So thank you very much. Always a pleasure.